contact that artery artery to a specific area of tissue. So maybe like with a heart attack, a coronary artery in the heart gets blocked that supplies the left ventricle with blood. So that localized area of heart tissue doesn't get enough blood and oxygen, and that damage is localized to that left ventricle. Shock is like ischemia, but on a global scale. In other words, it's a whole body circulatory failure, where blood flow to tissues is dangerously low, leading to cellular injury, possibly damaging multiple organs, and even leading to multiple organ failure if not treated immediately. Okay, so with shock, the body's tissues aren't getting enough oxygen via the blood, right? Normally, blood perfuses through tissue and delivers oxygen because there's enough pressure in the circulatory system to push it through. So blood pressure is a major determinant for the amount of blood perfusing through tissues. Now, blood pressure is determined by two components, the resistance to blood flow in the blood vessels, things like vessel length, blood viscosity, and vessel diameter, and the cardiac output, which is the volume of blood pumped by the heart through the body per minute. And you can break that into heart rate, the number of beats per minute, times stroke volume, the amount pumped out each beat. Going even further, the stroke volume is found by taking the total volume of blood left over after contraction, the end systolic volume, and subtracting it from the total volume in the heart after filling, the end diastolic volume. Alright, now keeping all those in mind, shock can be caused by a whole bunch of different things, but we can categorize the different types of shock into three main categories, along with some subcategories here and there. The first category is called hypovolemic shock. Hypo means low, vol refers to volume, and emia refers to the blood. So hypovolemic shock is shock induced by a low fluid volume of blood. And this could be either non-hemorrhagic or hemorrhagic. Non-hemorrhagic means that the loss of fluid volume isn't from bleeding. So this could be like if you were stranded in a desert and suffered severe dehydration. Eventually your loss of fluid and sweat would reduce blood volume to where it wouldn't be enough to supply your body's organs and you develop hypovolemic shock. Hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock, on the other hand, is loss of blood volume through ruptured blood vessels, in other words, from bleeding. A loss of about 20% of your total blood volume, roughly one liter, can be enough to induce hypovolemic shock, and when that liter of blood leaves the circulation, the total volume filling into the heart goes down, meaning the end diastolic volume goes down, right? This means stroke volume goes down as well, which causes cardiac output to go down, and finally we see that blood pressure goes down. When cardiac output goes down, catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine, ADH and angiotensin II are released, all of which cause vasoconstriction of blood vessels, which increases vascular resistance and increases heart rate, which increases cardiac output. And these combined effects all increase blood pressure. A super important indicator of tissues not getting enough oxygen due to hypovolemia is a decreased mixed venous oxygen saturation, or MVO2. MVO2 is the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin in blood coming to the right side of the heart from the tissues. So it's like the amount of oxygen left over, or not extracted and used by the tissues. So if blood volume's down, that means oxygen's down, and there's going to be less left over, right? So MVO2 will be down with hypovolemic shock. Since blood flow provides heat to the tissues as well, when it's down, the skin starts to feel cool and clammy, and so hypovolemic shock is considered a cold shock. A second main category of shock is cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic means produced by the heart, right? So this is when something happens to the heart such that now it can't pump enough blood to the body's tissues. The most common cause is acute myocardial infarction, or heart attack. Hold on a second, though. Didn't I say at the beginning that that was more along the lines of localized ischemia? Well, the heart attack itself reflects ischemia, right? But these effects of the initial cardiac damage eventually leads to a state of shock. When the heart's muscle cells die, it can't contract as hard, which means the amount of blood pumped out, or stroke volume, goes down, and therefore cardiac output goes down as well. In the same way as with hypovolemic shock, the body releases vasoconstrictors to increase vascular resistance and help maintain blood pressure. Also, as with hypovolemic shock, MDO2 will be down since there's less oxygen being pumped out, and so less will be left over. Sometimes there might be an obstruction that doesn't allow the heart to fill properly with blood. For example, we might have the pericardial sac fill up with fluid from an infection or blood from a traumatic accident like getting stabbed in the chest. 
If this sac fills up, it physically constricts the heart from expanding and contracting normally, and also reduces the stroke volume. This is sometimes subclassified as obstructive shock. But you can see that the cause is still due to the heart's inability to do its job, right? Similarly to hypovolemic shock, a reduction in cardiac output leads to lowered blood flow, so the skin gets cool and clammy, and so cardiogenic shock is also considered a kind of cold shock. Alright, the third main category of shock is called distributive shock, where there's typically a leakiness of blood vessels and an excessive amount of arterial vasodilation, or widening of the peripheral blood vessels, which remember is one of the components of vascular resistance. If arterioles dilate, vascular resistance to blood flow goes down and blood pressure goes down, leading to less perfusion and distribution of blood to organs and tissues. Now the most common type of distributive shock is septic shock from pathogens in the blood. What happens with septic shock is endotoxins, these large clunky lipopolysaccharide molecules, sometimes just called LPSs, found in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria causes a crazy cascade of events that ultimately leads to lowered perfusion. First, these guys directly damage endothelial cells and cause them to release vasodilators like nitric oxide. They also activate the complement pathway in the blood, which stimulates mast cell release of histamine, another vasodilator. The LPS molecules also activate immune cells like macrophages and neutrophils, which help create a bunch of pro-inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1. These help the immune system destroy the invaders, but they also stimulate the endothelial cells to release more inflammatory molecules like platelet activating factor and reactive oxygen species. All of these inflammatory chemicals damage the endothelial cells and increases their vascular permeability, making the blood vessels leaky. Also, endothelial cells express a procoagulant called tissue factor. Procoagulants are molecules that increase blood coagulation, or blood clotting. And this, in combination with an overall decrease in anticoagulants, which usually decrease clotting and seem to be often depleted or used up during sepsis, leads to this net increase in coagulation and clotting in the microvasculature. And of course, clotting and blockages in the blood vessels further decreases perfusion, right? Okay, so this widespread vasodilation means very little vascular resistance, and blood can't get the chance to unload as much oxygen as it cruises through the vasculature, and it gets back to the right side of the heart with leftover oxygen. So in this case, as opposed to cardiogenic and hypovolemic shock, MVO2 can be normal or even increased. In contrast to hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock, now there's an increase in flow in the peripheral blood vessels, and the skin becomes warm and flushed. So distributive shock is a kind of warm shock. The overall combined effects of widespread vasodilation, increased vascular permeability, and microvascular blood clotting all contribute to decreased perfusion of blood to vital organs. Now two kind of subtypes of distributive shock are anaphylactic shock, which is an allergic reaction that causes dangerously low blood pressure, and neurogenic shock, where the nervous system gets damaged and can't control the body's blood pressure. The treatment of shock depends on the cause. In general, the goal is to stabilize blood pressure so that vital organs like the heart and the brain are perfused with blood. In order to stabilize blood pressure, fluid replacement and medications that increase heart contractility, cause vasoconstriction, and retain fluid can be administered. Oftentimes a person might need supplemental oxygen or have their airway protected, for example with intubation. Alright, as a quick recap. Shock is ultimately a failure in tissue perfusion, and it affects the whole body, putting tissues and organs at risk for injury and ultimately organ failure. Hypovolemic shock happens when dehydration or hemorrhage reduces the volume of blood in the blood vessels. Cardiogenic shock happens when a direct injury like a heart attack or an obstruction like a pericardial effusion prevents the heart from pumping blood efficiently. Distributive shock happens when something like an allergic reaction or damage to the nervous system, called neurogenic shock, causes the blood vessels to vasodilate and become leaky, which reduces the resistance and lowers the blood pressure. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in a deeper dive on this topic, next all of them, look at this picture and what condition do you think about now? And now. 
is crush syndrome. It called in many ways crush syndrome, compression trauma, by water syndrome or compartment syndrome resulting from a prolonged violation of blood supply, ischemia, or compressed soft tissues, toxins characterizing addition of to local systemic pathological changes in the form of hyperkalemia and renal failure. It occurs in victims of earthquakes, blockages in mines, uh, collapses, etc. Uh, we call this syndrome by the name of biotters. It's not accidental. It was a doctor in the London in the during Second World War during the Nazi Germany bombardment of the city. Many patients uh, go under to the parts of the building, and uh, after they take these patients out, out they uh, apply some bandage, they stabilize their, uh, they stabilize their uh, blood circulation and uh, after a couple of days they die. It's first case where they die. Because particles of the destructed uh, cells or erythrocytes going to the kidney and uh, these patients uh, go to the deep kidney failure. This is one case. Another case, uh, people under the, uh, under the parts of the buildings laying for hours, uh, they uh, was in pain but they can talk and uh, when they took this patient from this broken buildings and the uh, patient immediately die but second before that patient can talk with you what is the cause of the death of this patient it's hyperkalemia because if we destroy the muscles uh, we have many potassium into the muscles and when they go to the bloodstream they go to the heart and they stop the heart during uh, due to their electroly electrolytic activity we have four different uh, stages of severity it's slight form compression of the limb segment for four hours medium Compression of entire limb for 6 hours, severe form, compression of the limb for 7 or 8 hours, and extremely severe form, it's both limbs more than 6 hours. Before removing the victim from the rubble, it is necessary to evaluate the level of consciousness, evaluate ex external respiration and oxygenation with deep depression of consciousness, uh, deep depression of consciousness, it means less than 11 points of Glasgow Coma Scale. Assess the presence of circulatory insufficiency. If there are signs of circulatory arrest, start cardiopulmonary resurrection. Uh, you must give... Uh, sorry, I didn't translate this page. You must give uh, some painkillers to this uh, patient. It can be narcotic uh, analgetics like morphine, hydrochloric or uh, non-narcotic um, analgetics like ketoprofen or ketamine oh sorry, like ketoprofen provide vascular access, you must give intravenous line uh, bore needle, maybe even two on the different hands Start conducting infusion therapy to correct hypovolemia. Um, you must dilute the blood and you must dilute the um, complications of hyperkalemia and acidosis. It is advisable to carry out infusion therapy with sodium containing crystalloids. Directly during extraction, the presence of at least two rescuers is desirable. 
one of which frees the limb from compression starting from the center to the periphery. The other simultaneously in the same direction binds the limb with an elastic bandage, moderately squeezing the soft tissues, which significantly reduce the flow of venous blood and prevents the development of tonsil shock. After complete extraction of the ruins carried out in the immobilization of the injured limb as in trauma, the immobilized limb is covered with ice. In the presence of wounds and other violations of the integrity of the skin, carry out their mechanical cleaning and apply dressing with antiseptic uh, by the water hexidine or povidonidine. Immediate medical evacuation of the patient to a multi-specialty hospital that has an extracorporeal detoxication service with the, within the olden, olden hour rule. Transportation of the victim to the hospital is carried out lying on a stretcher, symptomatic continued infusion, analgesic if indicated and sedative if indicated therapy rule. Golden hour, it means we must uh, take our patient to the hospital during uh, one hour. And you must remember a place not a banner here. When you uh, try to substitute some volume, you should not use the uh, solution which have potassium uh, as one of their component. And if you see potassium and people have hyperkalemia, hyper or high potassium and if you add some potassium with fluid you can kill this patient and I want to show you another two videos which help you to which help you understand this condition learning medicine learning medicine is hard Create a personalized study plan with exclusive flashcards and so much more. Try it free today. With compartment syndrome, compartment refers to separate sections of the body that contain muscles, nerves, and blood vessels surrounded by a layer of fibrous connective tissue. When the pressure within these compartments rises, normal blood flow can be cut off, leading to tissue damage due to hypoxia or the lack of oxygen. Compartment syndrome typically happens in the limbs, usually in the lower leg or the forearm. Now, if we remove the skin and then we remove the fat from the lower leg, we would uncover the fascia. Fascia surrounds the muscles, keeping them tightly together while they contract to move the limb, and it also helps attach these muscles to the bones. Now, if we look at a cross section of the lower leg, we can see that the fascia sends intermuscular septa that together with the interosseous membrane between the tibia and fibula, divide the lower leg into four compartments. The anterior, lateral, deep posterior, and superficial posterior compartments all contain their own muscles and blood vessels. For example, the anterior compartment holds the muscles that perform dorsiflexion of the foot and also aid in its inversion and eversion. The deep perineal nerve that innervates them and its blood supply come from the anterior tibial artery and veins. Since the fascia is not elastic, it can't stretch much. Therefore, any increase of the cellular and extracellular volume, or a decrease of the volume capacity, like with some external compression, will lead to the increase of the pressure inside the compartment. This will compress the structures within, and the first ones to feel the effect of compression are the veins, because the pressure inside their lumen is normally low. As the pressure increases, the arteries will become compressed next, and this obstructs the normal blood flow. This cuts off the oxygen supply and hypoxia develops which causes cells to start releasing substances like histamine and nitric oxide. These substances cause capillaries to become leaky, 
so fluid leaks out, causing extracellular edema that further increases intercompartment pressure. Okay, let's look at the muscle cells. Hypoxia prevent their mitochondria from producing adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, which is the cell's main source of energy. Inside the cell membrane is a sodium-potassium pump that needs ATP in order to pump sodium out of the cell and potassium inside. So without ATP, there's an increase in intracellular sodium levels, which cause water to move into the cells, causing intracellular edema. If hypoxia lasts too long, intracellular edema can lead to cell membrane rupture, causing proteins to leak out into the extracellular space. These proteins draw more water from the capillaries, and we get a vicious cycle of increased compartment pressure, tissue hypoxia, edema, followed by cellular death, and even more pressure. The most common cause of compartment syndrome is bleeding inside the compartment. This typically occurs with long bone fractures, like the tibia or the forearm bones, in penetrating wounds or surgical procedures that injure blood vessels. Other causes are swelling of the tissue after severe burns, intravenous drug injection, repetitive use of the injured muscles, or a vigorous muscle contraction like in tetany or seizures. Any limb compression, like from a crush injury or from an inappropriately placed cast, can also lead to compartment syndrome. Another potential cause could be reperfusion injury. This occurs with the re-establishment of normal blood flow to hypoxic cells. These cells stop producing proteins, like antioxidants. So providing them with oxygen again can actually lead to the formation of toxic reactive oxygen species that they can't get rid of. Signs and symptoms of compartment syndrome can be remembered as the six P's, which are pain, paresthesia, pulselessness, pallor, poikilothermia, and paralysis. The most common is pain, which is usually described as sharp and deep, and worsens with passive stretching of the affected muscles. Pain is followed by paresthesia, which is an abnormal sensation like feeling of pins and needles or numbness that can even progress to anesthesia or loss of sensation. The other four P's are less common, as pulselessness appears only when the compartment pressure is so high that it makes the arteries collapse. Then a pallor of the skin can appear together with poikilothermia, which is the inability to regulate body temperature and usually presents as cold extremities. Paralysis is rare and suggests extensive damage to both the muscles and nerves. Complications such as necrosis can occur when normal blood flow is not established in time, leading to tissue death due to the lack of oxygen. For example, necrosis of the flexor muscles of the forearm leads to their fibrosis and shortening, which results in permanent flexion of the wrist and hand, known as Volkmann's contracture. Another complication is rhabdomyolysis, where muscles break down. Muscle proteins, like creatine kinase and myoglobin, start leaking out into the bloodstream. Myoglobin is especially toxic for the kidneys and can cause acute renal failure. Diagnosis includes physical examination, where the affected group of muscles appears stiff, firm, and feels hard like wood. The individual complains of pain that worsens with passive stretching of the muscles. The best diagnostic tools are the intracompartmental pressure monitors that can be inserted directly inside the compartment. When rhabdomyolysis develops, a laboratory workup can show elevated levels of creatine kinase and myoglobin, while urinalysis can show T-colored urine due to high levels of myoglobin. Imaging techniques like radiography, CT, MRI, and ultrasound can help locate bone, muscle, and blood vessel injuries. Treatment is surgical and involves a procedure called fasciotomy, where the fascia is cut open, relieving the pressure, and re-establishing normal blood flow. Fascia can be left open for a few days until the cause of increased pressure is treated. When the compartment syndrome is caused by some external factors, like an inappropriate cast, its removal can result in spontaneous recovery and the surgery may not be needed. All right, as a quick recap. Compartment syndrome refers to the increased pressure inside the section of the limb that contains muscles, nerves, and blood vessels, and results in the reduction of blood supply and tissue necrosis. It usually develops in the lower leg and forearm after traumas like a bone fracture. If not treated in time, it can lead to permanent muscle and nerve damage. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in a deeper dive on this topic, And another one video.
Dr. Jess Mason, and this is Dr. Walid Hamoud, and we are going to show you how to check compartment pressures. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Let's do this. Why don't you get that all sterile and anesthetized? Now, we're going to do this in three parts. First, we are going to show you how to set up and calibrate and use the Stryker intracompartmental pressure monitor system. Then we're going to do a little bit of a review of the anatomic compartments and where to insert the needle for each compartment. And finally, we're just going to top it off with a little bit of rainbow sprinkles and do some pathophysiology right there at the end. All right, so uh, there's one thing you need to remember before you start, and that's the number 30. The number's 30. What's the number? 30. That's right. And that's because if the pressure in any compartment is above 30, that's bad. Also, if the delta pressure, which is the difference between the diastolic blood pressure and the compartment pressure, if the difference between those is less than 30, also bad. Now, let's get started. To set it up, you have your sterile components, a 3cc sterile saline syringe. You have the chamber, and you're going to connect them thusly. Now you're going to connect the needle to the other side. And the needle has a side port for measuring the pressures. And we're going to clear out the air in the chamber by injecting the saline into the chamber. No air bubbles are allowed. And you do this holding it at 45 degrees. And you may have to give it a little bit of a, an aggressive flick, like a sub hematoma kind of flick. There. Easy peasy, looks good. Now we're gonna load this into our pressure monitor. So we'll open this chamber up and it should snap right in place. The drawer should close nice and easily. If it doesn't, then you need to readjust the angle of the flange of your syringe. Let's turn it on and to zero it, you're gonna hold it at the angle that you're gonna use to insert it into the patient. And you're gonna hit the button conveniently labeled zero and you should get zero on the screen. Now we're ready to check our compartment pressure. So put on a fresh sterile glove, repalpate your landmarks, and go ahead and insert it into the compartment. You might feel a pop as you go through the fascia. Inject about 0.3 ml of saline and now it should read your compartment pressure. You know you're in the right place because if you squeeze that compartment, you'll get a rise in the pressure. The pressure is over 30, so this is consistent with compartment syndrome, and I think he's gonna need a fasciotomy. I'm sorry, sir. Well, how about now we review the anatomic compartments? The lower leg has four compartments that Dr. Hamoud has volunteered to help us demonstrate. For all of the compartments, you're gonna go at the imaginary cross-sectional line about one-third the way down the tibia. For the anterior compartment, palpate the tibia and go one centimeter laterally. Insert the needle one to three centimeters deep and the pressure should rise with plantar flexion of the foot. For the lateral compartment, palpate the posterior border of the fibula and insert the needle just anterior to this, aiming right towards the fibula. Go about one centimeter deep and the pressure should rise with inversion of the foot. Aim for the deep posterior compartment by grabbing the medial border of the tibia on one side and the lateral border of the fibula on the other side. Insert the needle medially, aiming towards the posterior fibula and go about two to four centimeters in. The pressure should rise with extension of the toes. And finally, the superficial posterior compartment. Go three to five centimeters off midline and insert the needle two to four centimeters deep. The pressure will rise with dorsiflexion of the foot. The forearm has two main compartments. Okay, arguably, maybe more, but two that we're gonna focus on, the common ones. And again, for both of these, you're going about one third the way down the forearm. For the volar compartment, position the patient like they're doing an arm curl, then have them oppose their thumb and small finger and flex against resistance. Track that palmaris longus tendon up and insert the needle just medial to this point aiming towards the ulna. Go one to two centimeters deep and the pressure rises with extension of the wrist. To find the dorsal compartment, have the patient palm down and palpate the ulna. Go one centimeter towards the radius and insert the needle one to two centimeters deep. The pressure rises with flexion at the wrist. 
Did you get all that? I know it was a lot and we went kind of fast, so we're gonna do a little bit of a review of the clinical findings that you gotta know for compartment syndrome. And remember, there are five Ps. The first one is pain out of proportion. Then we've got paresthesia, we've got pallor, paresis, and pulse deficit. But the most important one, and the one you're gonna remember, is pain out of proportion because that's the one you're usually going to see first before the other ones happen. The other thing that you gotta remember is the number 30. That's 30 millimeters of mercury. A compartment pressure above 30 is very concerning, or if that delta pressure narrows down so it's less than 30, then that's also really bad. Okay, we got this, right? We got it? Now you know what to do when you're under pressure. So, thank you for your attention. I wish you a good luck. Goodbye.